Happy Pride Month! Queen's Public Library continues its ongoing commitment to promote queer liberation and representation across our borough and beyond. Whether you're looking for books and resources, engaging in inclusive programs, or just seeking a welcoming space, we are here for you. Come on by and let us know what's your query. For more information, visit queenslib.org forward slash pride 2023. Summer reading kicks off this month. Visit summerreading.queenslibrary.org for our full summer reading program schedule, book lists for all ages, and other resources to keep your kids engaged and learning all summer long. Juneteenth celebrates the end of slavery in the United States. Check out our reading lists and join us for a wide range of programs to learn more about this important day in U.S. history. Visit our website for more information. Welcome to Queen's Public Library's talk with filmmaker Chase Joint, the director of the feature film Framing Agnes, and Abby Stein, activist, public speaker, and author of Becoming Eve, My Journey from Ultra-Orthodox Rabbi to Transgender Woman. About Framing Agnes, the Los Angeles Times states, a fascinating multidimensional mosaic-like glimpse at transgender life from the 1950s to today as interpreted by and through a group of academic transmasculine and transfeminine performers and creatives, and one uniquely impressive academic. RogerEbert.com declares that Framing Agnes is essential viewing. The New York Times writes about Framing Agnes. Joint scope as a researcher is admirably broad. Publishers Weekly wrote of Stein's book, Becoming Eve, the harrowing and inspiring story of the exploration, discovery, and acceptance of her truth, both body and soul, Jewish Journal stated of Becoming Eve, a frank account of an exceptional life. Stein is a gifted writer, full of grace and compassion. Hi, I'm Brian Alessandro. I have written for Interview Magazine, Newsday, Penk, Huffington Post, Lambda Literary, The Gay and Lesbian Review, and I recently co-adapted Edmund White's A Boy's Own Story into a graphic novel for Top Shelf Productions. Additionally, I co-edited Fever Spores, the queer reclamation of William S. Burroughs, an anthology of essays and interviews about Burroughs for Rebel Satori Press. I'm also the co-founder and editor-in-chief of the literary journal, The New Engagement, my first novel, The Unmentionable Mon, was published in 2015 by Cam Press, and my first feature film, Afghan Hound, was produced by Marier Media in 2011. It is currently streaming on Plex, Tubi, and Amazon. My new novel, Performer Non Grata, was released in April by Rebel Satori Press. Culture Connection, curated by Daniel Zaleski and now in its 10th year at the Queen's Public Library, is proud to present international artists from emerging talent to award-winning masters. These disciplines include music, theater, author talks, and film. Now expanding into a virtual format, Culture Connection is currently reaching a global audience. Chase Joint is a Canadian filmmaker, writer, video artist, actor, and professor. He attracted acclaim as co-director with Aisling Chin Yi of the documentary film No Ordinary Man in 2020 for framing Agnes Joint won two awards at the 2022 Sundance Film Festival. Abby Stein is an American transgender author, activist, blogger, model, speaker, and rabbi. She's the first openly transgender woman raised in a Hasidic community and is a direct descendant of Hasidic Judaism's founder, the Baal Shem Tov. In 2015, she founded the first support group nationwide for trans people with an Orthodox Jewish background. Her memoir, Becoming Eve, My Journey from Ultra-Orthodox Rabbi to Transgender Woman, was published in 2019. Thank you so very much, Chase and Abby, for joining us this evening. So happy Thank to be here. Thank you for having us. My pleasure. It's our pleasure. So to borrow a phrase um, that you use in the film, uh, how did you, Chase and Abby, first encounter Agnes? And please also tell us a little bit about Agnes and her engagement with Robert Stoller and Harold Garfinkel and their research at UCLA. I'm happy to go first, Abby. <laughs> I feel like you have so much more to say. I, 
I want to talk a bit about it. And I did know a bit about, not about Agnes specifically, but about the UCLA and like everything, the whole story around. But obviously, you know way more. Go for it, please. I love that. I love that. Next time you're going first. So, <laughs> okay. Okay. Deal. you know, I really started paying attention to Agnes' story when I received a fellowship to work collaboratively with my friend, Kristen Schilt, who's a professor mm -hmm. of sociology. And we taught a class together. And one of the things that we were trying to think out loud about with students was the ways in which different disciplines can make different meaning using the same source material. Mm. So the case study of Agnes emerges in a very obscure sociological text in the 1960s and gets reinterpreted mm -hmm. by psychologists and queer theorists and trans activists mm -hmm. for a variety of different reasons. And it was so exciting to think about how we can track the ways in which meaning gets made about trans life mm -hmm. through the reinterpretation of Agnes's story. And, mm -hmm. and we explore all of those various threads in the film. But to make a very long and very complicated story short, Agnes was a trans teen who approached the mm -hmm. UCLA gender clinic in the late 1950s, saying that she was spontaneously feminizing, trying to seek the gender affirming care that she desired and required. And she's known on account of telling a very particular version of a life story, which many consider to be a lie, in order to make her way through the gatekeeping apparatuses of that institution at the time. And so she gets taken up in a variety of complicated ways as a rogue hero who manipulates a system that's designed to exclude her, but also as one of the ways in which trans people can be interpreted as deceptive and or as liars. And I thought it was really fascinating the way you handle that aspect of it. And we're going to look at it a little bit more closely in a moment. But Abby, did you want to add to that as well? Or... Um, I want to say just two things. And you asked specifically like the first encounter. And like I first mm -hmm. came across the UCLA clinic generally on, on uh, like someone mentioned it, and this was for me around 2012 already. Um, and I don't want to give too many spoilers for my book because I hope people will buy it still. But yes. it's been three years, so I'm allowed to say um, I was on, active on this one. This was a few years before I even started any transition or coming out. Um, but I, there was a whole like form on there uh, of people talking about um, secretive ways of trying. Mm -hmm. Specifically for, it, was, it was specifically for trans women, though I believe there was also an equivalent for trans men. Obviously, I was focused on the trans femme side mm -hmm. of um, people having to go through different, you know, hoops and uh, to trying to either convince themselves, the people around them, that they are who they are. And at the time, I was still living fully in the Hasidic community. I was married mm -hmm. and still it felt like, forget about transitioning, it felt like the mountain of even getting close to coming out or doing anything felt almost like impossible. Hmm. And I started reading about all of those different stories and different anecdotes and different uh, times throughout history of people trying to find clever, with quotation marks, um, ways of both making sense, but also getting the care and getting the help that they need. Um, and that was my sure. first encounter, I guess, with the UCLA clinic, I think as a whole, uh, probably Agnes came up as well. I don't remember that exactly. But I want to say, though, uh, if I may, and I mentioned that to Chase uh, before we came on when we were backstage, so to speak, um, I also want to point out my friend, Zachary, who plays Agnes in the film, Zachary Drucker, uh, which was kind of like, for me, feels another way of meeting Agnes, I guess, in the, in the context of the character. Um, but uh, she was basically the reason why um, I started kind of like following the film from the second it was announced and then went to watch it one of the first times it was playing in New York City. Um, and I am going to be fully honest, and I'm not usually someone who gets starstruck, so I'm not going to use that term, but it's truly amazing and an honor because that film, I don't often watch a film and I feel like this is a life-changing experience. Mm. Okay, mm. stop if I'm going too far. but. Wow. I, Truly had that experience because that felt like a story that we need so much right now. This realization mm -hmm. that people in a time when no one was talking about it, no one like yeah. literally like no one was pushing it on her to talk to to talk a bit some of the other nonsense that in conversations we're hearing right now about mm -hmm. health. And there you find someone going out of their way, and this is historical. This, these are uh, recorded cases throughout mm -hmm. history, obviously, but specifically over the past decades, before it became easy, which 
it's still, let's be honest, still very far from that. And before people had access. And I think it's just such a powerful story. Oh. Um, so yeah, so that was my emotional and very powerful experience of meeting, framing Agnes. So, and, that was and, very and you mentioned Zachary Drucker and, and the performance, uh, the embodiment of, of Agnes is so, so dignified and powerful um, and, and, and cool. And, you know, it's just spellbinding to watch. Um, I, I, I think that uh, Zachary is a tremendous performer uh, and, and personality. Uh, so Christine Jorgensen is, is touched upon briefly uh, early on in the film. How did Christine Jorgensen in 1952 inform Agnes's perception maybe of what was possible and also how the world behaves? So one of the things that's quite striking about the archival transcripts that we found in the private holdings of Harold Garfinkel, the sociologist who was speaking to Agnes in the mm -hmm. late 1950s and early 1960s, was that time and time again, Christine Jorgensen would appear as the first spark or first person that people saw who caused them to believe that there were trans people in the world who might have been a little bit like them. Not exactly, but something that resonated, something that sparked. And this is also where we started to build the central conceit of the film, which is what happens if we start thinking about contexts of medicine and media yes. simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So we make a, a, a dramatic move, which is to conflate the stage of the research clinic with that of the talk show. And one of the reasons why we felt able to do that is because the kinds of questions that talk show hosts of the early, you know, the mid century to the eighties and nineties, the ways in which those people were asking trans and gender nonconforming people about their lives are eerily similar to the kinds of questions that were being asked by sociologists and psychologists in these early research environments through to today. Mm -hmm. And so there was a way that Jorgensen became a spark and a touch point, a way to say it's something that's happening. It's a mediatized representation of trans life that is now circulating in contexts of medicine as what, you know, Laverne Cox has identified as a kind of possibility model. And we can think about mm -hmm. the circulation of that kind of term and all of its possibilities and limitations. But also it was an exceptional middle to upper class white narrative of trans femininity mm -hmm. that also became a pigeonhole and something that we have continued to think about in the contemporary politics of representation related to trans life today. You actually ended up uh, answering two questions. Oh, this, the follow-up question was gonna be what what, uh, what informed your brilliant approach to have these reenactments and, and you already answered that. And I do have to say kudos because it's a very novel and evocative and I think a effective uh, approach to telling a story and, and and capturing a period and and real moments. Abby, did you want to respond to either one of those points? <laughs> I don't think I don't think I can obviously they're very specific to the film. And yes, as I yes. said before, um, other than a lot of admiration and, and obviously a personal connection, both like obviously knowing the people involved and mm -hmm. the story as a whole. I'm not a filmmaker. Um, I am a storyteller, so that's what I, like I do love to see the power of it and i believe and i think um i will say the one thing i will say is um we know that from studies and it's one of the most powerful tools that we have is storytelling and oh, yes. that we approach that um mm -hmm. and in that way um this is if i may say far more than just a story and it's far more than just a film it is a piece of not just activism it's a piece of revolutionary mm -hmm. um there I say mind bending, and it's like it's like you said, Shay. It's like like people at that time starting to realize that there are other people like them, which I know for all of us. Um, I don't know if either one of you read my book, but I know for me, like that moment of realizing when I was like twenty and like sitting in a public bathroom because it's the only place where I could have internet access and learning that there are other trans people after twenty years of being convinced that I'm the only person, even though. I knew very much what, who I am. And like, so there's so much to this that is so universal, but the unique kind of like flavors of the story and the ability to show that and the way both the story and the film has been produced is powerful. Yeah, yeah exactly. Not just for what happened decades ago, but for even more so for what's happening right now. And I think specifically over the past few months, I guess uh, I think yeah. everything from an acting point of view, mm -hmm. and like this is so much like forget I, I use my own story sometimes to like counter the narrative of like the media and everything and i'm like i try to take merit into my own hand 
that's as much as I will say, when I was four, without ever access to TV or anything. And I think Agnes tells the same story of obviously people not influenced by, it's not like Hollywood at the time had any anything about this and so on. I think that's, yeah. It's a beautiful uh, sort of summation of that. Um, Ab, thank you. Uh, there are other case studies that you ended up happening upon of gender non-conforming people, Chase Wall researching Agnes, uh, Barbara, Georgia, Henry, Denny, Jimmy. Can you, there, there's, there are many of them, right? But can you sort of give me an overview or a summary of that discovery and then how you decided to approach um, their stories? Yeah, absolutely. So Kristen and I spent many very nerdy, geeky years <laughs> in these archives for the love and fun of, of friendship and research and didn't know that we would happen upon these transcripts. Frankly, didn't really know they existed. We were right. looking for Agnes and we were so mm -hmm. thrilled and overwhelmed to encounter these additional case files in the same drawer. And they are a wide array of trans identities, trans mask and trans femme identified people. There are people of a variety of different ages. And one of the things that immediately sparked was the resonances between those who we were finding on the page and those in our shared networks. So what did it mean to be encountering a trans masculine person named Henry who was writing about his life in the 1950s and using writing as an important outlet for self-determination? And to think about someone like Maximal Filario, who wrote a trans mask memoir in the early 2000s called The Testosterone Files that I read that was on my mom's bookshelf at some point when she was trying to figure out what was happening with her kid. Mm -hmm. Like a really important, mm -hmm. interesting, dynamic text in the history of trans masculine self-articulation. And so it's from those kinds of sparks that we were able to say, hey, in this example, Max, would you be willing to walk toward this? very hybrid, very experimental environment where you're at, we're asking you to be someone else, but also to be yourself simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And so one of yeah. the things that I've been, been saying about that process is it produces a, a kind of a third thing, you know, it's not just Henry, it's not just Max, there's something else that's happening on stage that to me is deeply trans and deeply collaborative, and is a kind of shift change between historical time periods and subjectivities mm -hmm. where Max and Henry in this example get to share something. Wow, that's great. I, oh, did you want to say, go ahead. I, I, yes. I wanted to ask actually, we don't have to do it now, we can come back to it later because I want to take this conversation to a, a kind of take it off the screen uh, to talk generally about queer, like queer and specifically trans char characters that I've been working with and also uh, shamelessly writing a book now about, but I feel like we maybe we want to stick to the film and come back to that later. Okay. Sure, th absolutely. I, please, please, let's come back to that because I absolutely okay. want to okay. explore it more deeply. Yeah, there's like so many, because I love the way you're saying it because I keep running into characters and some of them, sometimes it's, you have to like, you probably have seen that sometimes you have to ask yourself, are they just queer? Is it just about sexuality? Is it about gender? And some of them, it gets so intense, but yeah, when I don't want to, I don't want to go well, off yet. So let's well, take the film and then come back. Sure. Well, actually, this might go to that point on some level. Uh, in the film, Chase, you also do explore some of the frictions and rhetorical boundaries within the trans, drag, cross-dressing communities. Please talk to us, and Abby too, you as well, please, about the these groups and you know all of which are quite different from one another. But tell me also about the relationships of which I'm a, a, a cousin. <laughs> on some level as well. <laughs> I love that. You, you know, I asked the question uh, of Jen Richards in the film, one of our extraordinary interlocutors, and she does a magnificent job of charting the relation between these identificatory categories and the ways in which we borrow from them to produce certain kinds of visibility and community and then eschew them when we are threatened by what they produce mm. in various ways socio-political worlds. What does it mean mm -hmm. to be a trans person versus someone who identifies with drag or cross-dressing communities? Right. What does that afford us? What does that take away, et cetera? Mm -hmm. And I won't mm -hmm. rehearse everything that she says, but one of the things that I found really important and generative in the context of the film is that we don't know. We don't know how anybody identified. We don't know what anyone is doing. We actually only have these glimpses of life through archival transcripts that we know from the beginning 
are already versions of a life story that are being told to someone who holds more power in an exchange. And so sure. everything is already a strategy. And it's not to say that everyone is being untruthful or deceptive. It's saying that they're being strategic. And so mm -hmm. I want to tread lightly when we say, like, what do we learn about trans history? Or what do we learn about these people? I think we learn a hell of a lot about resilience. And mm -hmm. I think we learn a hell of a lot about how to live in amidst and alongside these institutions. But there's also this important work that's being done where you can tell important work in a variety of different ways. I want to be very careful in the way that I speak because there's an extractive economy where researchers are taking information and saying, okay, well, this person is saying this thing about this behavior and this person is saying this thing about this behavior. Well, can we build these categorical distinctions? Can we start putting people in boxes? Can we start drawing divisions? And those divisions start to become about access, about privilege, and we can think all the ways that race and class play into who falls into these different categorical buckets of research. And so for me, thinking out loud with Jen and also thinking out loud with Jules Gill Peterson, our historian yes. extraordinaire, yep. right, is one of the ways Incredible. to think about the consequences of categorization, mm -hmm. not so much the is with one thing right or, or wrong, or could these people be identified in this way, but rather to say what's at stake when we start using these words and these in these language to talk about these people. I was just going to say your film and Jules Gill Peterson in particular really does a stellar job of, of sort of presenting that and dissecting it and, and examining it. Um, I mean, critical theory level, uh, really wonderful stuff. Um, <laughs> Ab Abby? So much yes, and um, of to like to like everything, and like this always comes back to like the question of labels, and I think writers in general, whether it's for books or for TV, think a lot about labels, and there's obviously the power and the benefit of it. And I remember the first time um, I looked on my record, like I when I started going to a trans health clinic, and then looking on the records, and they have extreme transparency, and it's a community clinic, and it's amazing. So I get to see my, all my diagnosis. And then I got really upset and then spoke to the therapist who was also part of the same health center of being like, why do I need to have a very specific, like literally number diagnosis? And, and they were like, you, you have a good point in an ideal world, but the world we live in, if you want access to healthcare, you want access to medication, this is how it works for now. Mm. Um, and it's the same with labels and everything. And I think a lot about specific, and there's been some conversations specifically among um, uh, people who study Jewish texts a lot because there's, for example, um, in the Mishnah, which is the second century kind of rabbinic law code, there's a lot of talk about different categories that I personally perceive to be a different genders. And then other people are like, no, these are not genders. These are sex, even though not necessarily because they're talking about gender roles. But I will give you, I will admit those are not gender in the same way we think about gender. But what exactly is gender? And like, where, exa where do you draw that line? And at the end of the day, all of this, like gender is a construct. It doesn't mean it's not real, but it's still a construct. It's still something that we have decided where we draw those lines. And that comes back to impact all of us. But at the same time, it has a certain use. It's like, uh, I, I tell people a lot about um, labels being like something you usually put on clothes. And I'm like, most clothes you keep in the closet, we want to take everyone out of the closet. We don't need those labels because those labels go in the closet. But at the same time, sometimes you want to know which size something is because you want to know if it's going to fit you. You want to know. So labels are, I think a lot about this in terms of my sexuality personally and, and like with so many other people. It's very helpful sometimes, but at the same time, it prevents people from access to care, it prevents people like so many specifically in, in states where access to healthcare isn't as advanced or as open as in places like New York where I live is like you require a very specific diagnosis and if you go into your doctor and you're like I'm exploring even though exploring doesn't mean you know for sure you are not cis but you're exploring exactly why you are might actually prevent you from getting access it's navigating it's like Shay said it's navigating those systems but I'll say one other thing and we'll come back whenever we're ready to like, you know, move on to those texts that I that I want to just show. Um, and we can pull that up on the screen just to show some historical like anecdotes of people. And I look at that and I'm like, are we being honest with those stories when using modern labels on them? Mm -hmm. and frankly, I've gotten to a point where I tell people I don't I don't care. That's mm -hmm. not the point of the conversation, because right. I don't think we need to put everyone in a box today. Sure. Therefore, we don't need to put everyone in a box historically, but it's enough to look on that and be like, 
we don't have to understand exactly what their gender was and what their sexuality was or is to this day. I can tell you it wasn't cis and it wasn't hetero. And I think that is what's important. And that is the story that I want to dissect. That is the story that I want to do. And again, I think Framing Agnes does a really good job at, at doing that and having those conversations with actors and like how much of what Agnes is saying in those transcripts were real and how much was to like, you know, fool the doctors into giving her the care that she wanted. Right. Right, right. It doesn't really right. matter at the end of yeah. the day because it's Agreed. the fact that people do that and it's how we do that that really right. matters. And on the subject of identity and privilege, um, coming back to that, Black trans women first became the face of the trans movement and are also simultaneously the demographic of trans women most at risk for violence. Your film, Through Georgia and Angelica Ross, explores this mid-century divide between white trans women and black trans women, and also class, as you mentioned a minute ago, Chase. Can you say a little bit more about this? Yeah, absolutely. So you're picking up and summarizing some of the many offerings that, that Jules Gill Peterson yes. grounds for us in the context of the film. And actually, one of the ways that I can answer your question is to also return to your original prompt about Christine Jorgensen, where we start thinking about the exemplary case, who becomes the face of a moment or a movement. And so one of the things that Angelica and Jen and Jules point to in specifics is the way in which Black trans women were elevated to become the face of a certain moment in trans activism and trans visibility. And one of the things that our film attempts to do is to turn that back around and say, what's at stake when we start putting pressure on singular and or small groups of minoritized people? Mm -hmm. And we can say that something like that happened to the Christine Jorgensen's of the mid-century, and we can connect that treatment of both media and medicine to what's happening today. And so one of the things that Jules, I think, really productively asks both not only the film itself, but everyone watching is, what about those who don't have to do that work? What about those who get to escape the record? What about those who do not have to advocate in particular ways in public constantly for their rights and dignity, right? Yep. Turning that question, which I think has become overdetermined in many ways and linked mm -hmm. to a kind of general debate about the politics of visibility and asks it differently. And I think argues for the politics of opacity and invisibility as very necessary political tools, especially today. And, and thank you also for that because you, you just answered another one of my, my follow-up questions. <laughs> like we're, we're, we're having tele telepathic moments here. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, Abby. I, 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 like I put something, I'm not gonna say the name, I put it in a chat, I think we know who I'm talking about, but yeah, it's exactly like the case with so many people who are like, there yeah, have been yeah. some examples of some trans people, for example, who are like, I never, no one ever told me which bathroom to use. It's not a problem. Or like people who think that, I don't wanna to get too political. So let's just say people who think that certain people who are outwardly transphobic and they were like, oh no, you're not gonna impact me because I live in the binary and I fit into certain mm -hmm. places. And like no one ever tells me. And I'm like, yes, you are super rich and no one cares really. And it's like the conversations that we're having and who gets to be, I think a lot about that. And, and I have done more and more things when I, where I feel like when it comes to talking about, let's say the Hasidic community or like religious fundamentalist communities, it's important to center the voices of people like me and people like us who have come from that background. And very often at the same time though, I don't have to deal with discrimination based on my skin. Ethnicity maybe, but not not maybe, definitely, but not based on my skin and so on. And, and, and those important parts of like, who gets to be visible, who gets to be at a table, who gets to have those conversations. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's yeah, and you know, it, the, Jules Gill Peterson, um, sort of asserts that it's not, as you said, Chase, it's not doing people of the past who are recipients of bigotry and oppression any favors to turn them into icons decades later, right? Um, speaking of icons, <laughs> Laverne Cox responded to Katie Couric, uh, and, and it's in your film, I believe, uh, yeah, it yeah. is, about transitioning. Her question about transitioning was focused so much on the body. Uh, and Laverne said that that's actually a rather dangerous approach to take. Um, because we should be focusing on the lived experiences and the realities for trans people, not um, surgeries or, or bodies. And that was a defining moment, I think. 
Yeah, and I think it was a defining moment for many of us who might identify as transcultural producers who are steeped in a kind of media public. And, you know, I can share a small anecdote. Actually, I was recently in the world with the film and a young trans activist was in the, the audience. And when we bring Laverne up on a hyper mediatized stage, so the the footage of Laverne Cox on the Katie Couric show, which is already on a stage, is on a vintage television, which is on the stage where we are shooting the reenactments of our historical right. work, which is then on the screen in which you're watching it. So could not be more layered in wanting yeah. you to like recognize the mediatized force of this representation. And the person came up to me and was like, as soon as Laverne came up on the screen, I like immediately got anxious and I was like, oh no, you're not gonna do the thing that you're I hope your film is arguing against. And it was a knee jerk to, I think what the person was was worried was that all of a sudden we were gonna pop Laverne Cox and Carmen Carrera on Katie Couric up to do the work of the film or to do mm. the work of activism or to draw our attention to contemporary racism, right? Like all of these things. And so precisely, of course, the film is entirely organized around drawing attention to and repositioning the power of these exchanges in all kinds of ways. But to me, it was such an important and interesting conversation to have to say that is the force of that articulation. Yeah. That is the force of the pressure that someone like Laverne Cox is under. And that is the, the signification of the spark of her face on a TV screen, right? We already come to expect what is going to happen in that encounter. So part of the work of Framing Agnes is to think out loud about the force of that frame and the ways in which it expects certain things of, of trans speaking subjects. Yeah, the title is so genius, you know, framing Agnes and, and, and how we frame anything, how we frame any identity or any sort of representative of any group uh, and what we do to the, that thing that we're framing. Um, I wanna show the trailer, but before we do that, um, Abby, did you wanna comment on? I, I think I'm, yes. <laughs> it is okay. <laughs> and I don't. I don't need to talk all the time. We're good. Okay. okay. All right. Let's let's roll the Just trailer. Just imagine me saying everything that Chase is saying and like amplifying. <laughs> <laughs> Will do. I first encountered Agnes in graduate school. I read a case study about a young trans girl in the 1950s who lied her way into the UCLA gender clinic to get access to surgery. And I remember reading it and thinking, it's not telling the real story. Well, the flip for me to the talk show is in part a nod to the fact that the talk show was the place where many of us first encountered gender nonconforming subjects. You might be wondering where people go when they are experiencing problems of a sexual nature. An experimental research team at UCLA is interviewing dozens of people about emerging problems of sex and gender. It's wild to be a part of a project like this that kind of blows open a vault. Your parents must be a little overwhelmed by your desire for all these changes. Yeah, well, you know, they're old people. I have a friend, she's like me, and she helped me take a position as a receptionist at a hair salon. Does the owner know about you? They know I can type. I put a bit of paint over the F on my driver's license, but the police scraped it off. They asked me, are you a man or a woman? And I said, well, th that's a matter of opinion. We have heard the story told by the hunter and not by the lion, and not by the lions who not only fought back, but got away. So moving, Chase. Um, <clears throat> through through Dr. Jill Peterson, of course, who wrote a book uh, about transgender youth, and Jimmy, you discuss trans youth. It's something in the news every day now with some lawmakers seeking to defund and even make illegal the transitioning for minors. Please explain why this is dangerous and destructive, besides for the obvious reasons. 
Well, and Abby, come on in and, and, and join me in this conversation. I feel like I'm, I've been, I'm here. I'm, I'm, I'm all ears. ears. I'm all this ears. This is so much. Important. Yeah. Do you, do you want to start? Because I feel like this is a question of the film, but it's also a question of our of our current context. Yes, I mean, so. I, Ryan, you're amazing. So don't take this the wrong way. But I, I want to disagree with the whole like premise of this question. Like, like for me, the question isn't even why is this a problem? Why is this so dangerous? Like, the, like the simple fact before anything else, the fact of anyone, specifically politicians, specifically people who, let's be honest, are taking uh, something that impacts less than 1%. I, I've just come to that realization uh, recently, which isn't new, and a lot of us are aware of that. They are more intersex people, most of them might not know, but statistically speaking, there are more intersex people than trans people. Hmm. A lot of people will get shocked with it, but there's a, a some, an estimated around 1% of the population that's trans, and there's about 1.7% of the population that's intersex, just to give context to this whole uh, uh, trans panic, so to speak. The question, first and foremost, isn't like why, like you politicians specifically, but anyone who isn't directly, who isn't trans, to come and like try to even have any input in the healthcare of people that isn't the patient and the doctor mm. is just mind blowingly dangerous for everything in every case. But in a world where we just saw, you know, it's it's not by chance that the same states who were passing abortion restrictions are also passing trans restrictions. These are people who believe that they have a vision of the world and that their vision of the world is something they have the right to impose on everyone. And if someone doesn't fit that vision, whether it's a woman trying to make her own body choices, whether it's a couple trying to decide how they want to raise the kids and who they want to adopt kids from, or whether it is trans people trying to live, because that's what it is. The conversation here, and that's where I come to the part where it's so dangerous, I don't see this as people passing laws, whether or not trans people or trans youth get, get access to healthcare, get access to hormones, get access to surgery. Yes, surgery, and that's needed. That's, that's not even the question. The question is whether or not people get to live. Now, whether that's gonna be very physically literal live or whether that's gonna be being able to live as, their, as themselves, it's the same thing. Yeah. The, those bills are not being passed against healthcare. Obviously they are, but not just. They are being passed against people's right to live. Mm -hmm. That's where the danger comes in. I'm thinking, again, I, I, I come back to myself, and I know that every trans person, I don't want to talk for everyone, but every trans person can think about them for themselves. In those moments, specifically by the time you actually get to a doctor, and I know for so many people, it takes a long time. It took me three years from the realization that this is real, this is happening, this is a possibility to actually doing anything about it. I'm hearing an echo. Are you hearing an echo? It's very slight. It's okay, though. It's okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah you're fine. Yeah. Okay, Keep going, Abby. Okay, sorry. Um, by the time someone comes to a doctor for anything other than the pure decision of the doctor and of the hell decisions of what is the best what is the best course of action right now anything else and i'm saying this maybe not so easily but it's the reality anything else is is not a question of them having access it's a question of them not being able to live hmm. and know that it's true for so many of us there people love to throw around statistics and, and i'm sorry to bring it up so so i, I want to put that out I'm going to bring up suicide for a second. Um, so people love bringing that up without thinking, and obviously maybe with thinking and without thinking, very often that is the point, but you are causing that. You are, I know that uh, in, in Montana, uh, Zoe, uh, representative, Zoe, uh, like trans representative, got stopped from mm -hmm. uh, ever talking for saying this, and in other places, but... Those people literally have blood on their hands. It's not hyperbole. It's not hypothetical. It's the reality. It is the reality that when you prevent trans people from getting access to health care, and I would say even more, when you cause them that they have to do what Agnes had to do, that they had to do what people had to do at UCLA in the 60s of trying to uh, fool the doctors, because there are so many other side effects to not being open with your doctor. Mm -hmm. I 
simply can't imagine how my life would be if I wasn't able to go into my study, which by the way, I always tell people that trans people are probably the healthiest people on the planet because uh, how many other people get blood work every few months and, and get like a full panel done on everything to make sure everything is up to date. I can't imagine a reality where I can't go into my doctor and openly tell them exactly what I'm feeling, exactly what's going on, because I need to fool them into giving me what I need. Hmm. Dangerous. And yes, every person who has a part in that, and I will say even every person that has voted for someone like that has hmm. blood on their hands, because this is the reality. And I see it almost on a daily basis. I talk to so many people. Yes, usually it comes a bit to layer. I tend to work mostly people coming from fundamentalist religious backgrounds. And there's a whole other layer to dissect in there, but it's the reality. It's not a question of why is it bad to prevent trans health care? It is why in the world would anyone think that that's remotely okay? Yeah. I'm it sorry is. for that intense. No, no, no. Not at all. Don't apologize, please. And to think about it in the context of the film, you know, we're so lucky to be collaborating with Jules Gill Peterson, who wrote a book called Histories of the Transgender Child. And one of the central right. arguments among the many in that text is that trans kids are not new. Trans kids have always existed. And Jules' work seeks to elevate and make more visible some of these cases. And one of the rhetorical moves that's being made currently is that transness and trans kids in particular are a new and emerging phenomenon. And the incredible danger when something is positioned as having not existed before. And, you know, one of the things that Jules has said recently in public in support of our film is that, you know, without a history, you have no way in which to think back and build upon for your own life and your own imagination and your own curiosity. And so making visible these histories is also a form of, of life making for trans kids and trans people yes. today. Yeah. And, you know, the emergence of Jimmy in the archives at UCLA is an extraordinary gift. I mean, beyond the collaboration with Stephen Ira, which was in and of itself a gift the recognition that someone, a young teen, is coming into that space with a supportive mother and a hell of a sense of humor and a very strong sense of self and will not bend to the curiosities of the researchers and the doctors is very self-assured. And there is a really exciting moment of possibility there to, to get to gain access to that person's self-becoming at such a young age. Yeah. No, that's, that's great. I mean, I, I think uh, I, I where where do you see the discussion or the movement ten years down the line? I mean, are, are do you do you, are you optimistic? Do you think that there's going to be a great awakening? Um, do you think these politicians, these lawmakers, are going to suddenly like come to their senses and realize that what they're doing is extremely harmful? Take the political side. I feel like this is now. We're, now you're talking about my alley because politics <laughs> is what I do. Um, here's what, if I may say, and, and to use, let, let me put on my rabbi hat for a second because we had a there's a, a parable I grew up with a lot in, in Hasidic teachings that says that a fire, before it's put out, like the last few flames, it almost seems like it's flaming up for a second. Mm. You know, it seems like so like hate is like a burning fire, and the last as it knows that it's that it's going out the last few it's like that that rush for oxygen that rush yeah. for the last minute so last um, gasp. yeah, yeah. There, there's two parts here to look at there is the immediate future and there is the very far away future so um in the immediate future i'm terrified of how many people we're going to lose i have no other way of saying that um, um and and this doesn't seem i think it's i, I unfortunately think it's going to get worse before it gets better but if we zoom out for a second and we look on the bigger picture, and specifically in terms of decades, um, I do think, let, let, let's use this for an example, and, and if I may use parties for a minute. Um, and, and some people, it, sometimes it takes a second for people to realize this, but think of the reality of um, since 1990, there was only once that a Republican president won the popular vote literally once, and at that time it was also an incumbent president, president, and it was literally by 1%. Just to think of the demographic shift that this country has seen. Mm -hmm. um, it's the same with statistics. 10 years ago, the vast majority of Americans didn't know trans people, and the ones who did, there was a lot of negative attitudes. Yes, there's a lot more outward hate right now, but 
also over 50% of American support to some extent and to some form trans rights. That is unprecedented. Mm -hmm. The education that we have done, the work that we have done, it's coming back to the old saying, the arc of the, the, arc of the universe bends towards justice. And I think both from a political and also long-term, it's the same where it's a bit similar to a lot of other civil rights and a lot of other social justice movements where when it comes towards the end and the last push is always the most intense. Mm -hmm. um, and we saw that like, and it's literally where you're seeing the same talking points, whether it was in the 1920s about women getting the right to vote to like, uh, rights of LG, L, rights of LGBTQ people when it came to sexuality, lesbian and, gay, and gays and so on um, throughout uh, the second half of the 20th century, um, all the way to same-sex marriage, which think about it, 10 years ago, that was the hot button issue. And I'm not saying no one talks yeah. about it right now, but it's not, it's barely, it's barely mentioned. And I'm not saying it's not gonna come back if we're not vigilant, they will bring it back. They sure. will go after it. But the long, I don't know how long we're looking at, but I am, maybe I'm naive, but I'm 100% convinced that in the long run, we're gonna, this is gonna become a simple reality. The question is just of what's gonna happen in the immediate future, even in 10 years. I don't, I don't think this is gonna be solved in 10 years, even though, you know, looking at Gen Z, it gives a lot of hope, even in some so-called red states and so on. Um, but I am, a lot more concerned on the immediate future, the next five and 10 years, and how many people we are going to lose both physically and, and lose people in identity and so on because of all of this. And that is, I think, the bigger concern right now. Chase? I'm, I, I'm, I don't believe in equality on panels. I'm more than happy for Abby to, to, to <laughs> take the course of that question. I, I mean, I, hear what you said, what you have to you say. know, I resonate with the, the here and now insofar as I feel like we are in the middle of a crisis and people are advocating and making and working and living and breathing from that place. And I think we're trying to find new strategies of taking care of each other. And part of those strategies are not actually always living for a kind of visibility or for a kind of public and taking back some of the control over the way in which transness is represented. And paying close attention to the fact that transness, even while it can exist and function as an umbrella term, is actually populated by people with extraordinary differences that need to be honored and treated as such. And so uh, reconceiving what allyship means, like reconceiving what support and social justice work means, being on the ground and trying to boost differently than I think um, you know, it's a complicated, I, I'm, I'm pausing mid, I'm pausing mid sentence to say, I don't know the answer to the question that you're asking around where we are going to be in 10 years. And I think there was an earlier version of me who would have like flow, flowed and, and made something up. And there's something really interesting about the fact that I'm like, I just, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. And it's really, um, emotional to be on panels and in the context even of the world of this film where we are being asked these questions that I don't think you know we have answers to and I think that there's there's an important moment to sit in in that reality as well sure sure that was a very Talmudian answer there's a there's a verse in the Talmud that literally says like you should teach your thunk to say I don't know Hmm. Smartness of that, how like stupid people always know everything. Smart people say they don't know. Yeah, it's very Socratic, right? And Socrates used to say, <laughs> the, the, the person who admits to not knowing anything is the wisest. Um, Abby, tell us about the, you founded a group in 2015 for trans people with an Orthodox Jewish faith. Can you can you speak a little bit about that? I'm curious to learn well, more Well, at the time, that was, I, I would say that group by now got like more more observed between two other groups. Um, um, and I do want to give shout outs to both of them. One is called Eshel, which is specifically LGBT as a whole, though I think they needed a bit of push to do more specifically with trans people. They are a support group specifically for LGBTQ people of Orthodox background um, that by now has a very strong focus on trans as well, though that wasn't necessarily the case, not intentionally, but th that was a big part of my work at the time of like giving that push of 
making sure that trans people and trans voices are, are centered and, and focused on. Um, and then another group that um, also I get took on a lot of that work is called JQY, Jewish Queer Youth, that also does a lot of those work. But at the time, um, basically what happened was, and I, I wasn't planning on that at all. And I just had this thing where I, I used writing since I was really young. I literally still have stuff I wrote when I was six, uh, mm -hmm. where I would use writing to express my feelings and emotions. And as I started leaving the Hasidic community in 2012 already, um, I used blogs. I don't know if they were still popular in 2012, but they were at least in kind of like that very niche community of people leaving fundamentalist religious communities. Um, and then as I started to transition in the summer of 2015, I started writing a lot about you know, my my um, transition and talking about that. And I wasn't expecting it. And suddenly I started having, before I even came out publicly, I was already in touch with over 10 different people who are, who come from not just Hasidic, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give a crash course here even on, on the differences and the, the nuances between, I think Chase is smiling, <laughs> like knowing what I'm gonna talk about, the nuances between Orthodox, Ultra-Orthodox, Hasidic, non-Hasidic, but the, the, the gist of it, um, and start being in touch with a lot of people who come from or different streams of orthodox backgrounds. And um, as you said during the introduction, there was no one in the Hasidic community, which isn't that small. Uh, it's a few hundred thousand people across the world. No one who has been raised Hasidic has come out before. Uh, there were a handful or less of other like ultra orthodox communities. Um, and then I started realizing the need. And then uh, literally a few days after I came out publicly and my story kind of went viral without me planning it, it was just people jumped onto it. I, I wasn't expecting that at all. And it took me, it, it's a whole other story on that. But within a few days, I started a Facebook support group, which is the first of its mm -hmm. kind. And we had 25 members just within a few days of just literally me as a one person band kind of like reaching out and getting um, those people into a group. And now there's already several with, with dozens and maybe some of hundreds of members, some that I'm in, some that I can't even keep track, which is amazing and beautiful. I don't have to do everything. Like I, I, I'm I, proud to have had like created some of the first of its kind, but it was this obvious lack of, of the, and, and an obvious need for people who wear, there's like, I call it a double closet. We have the struggles of living in a very religious community where there's so many strict rules, not just about, not just about gender, but gender is a huge part of that. I, I very often call the Hasidic community the most gender segregated community in North America. And I'm not saying that easily. I actually spend time as an undergrad and working with people who are actually studying gender segregation, coming to that conclusion. We're talking like to give an example, a Friday night dinner at my grandparents with immediate family, meaning aunts, uncles, and, and first cousins, the men and women sit in separate rooms to give you a sense of, of, of how gender segregated those that is in ultra orthodox communities and kind of like that combination uh, was really intense. And I felt that I had the privilege and to at least get people to start talking about it. And I would say one other thing that was the most important for me was the part of education. I think most of my work has focused outward, kind of like working with the Jewish community as a whole, working with uh, what we would call formally fundamentalist. Uh, a lot of my friends, a lot of people that I work with come from different like non-Jewish but fundamentalist communities. Um, and then there's the part of like fo focusing inward kind of within the community. And for me, and at least that was the case when I came out, it wasn't even a question. There was no way to be trans in the Hasidic community. It wasn't a matter of are you gonna get discriminated against? It was simply, there, there was just no way of doing that. Um, but what I, I used to joke that I want them to become transphobic. Right, and what I mean so that right. is like, like I wanted them to start, I want I wanted Hasidic kids, I wanted an other nine-year-old child like myself who would like every night say a prayer to God because I thought that's the only option that I have to know that mm -hmm. trans people exist. And I have to say that uh, seven years after, it's like mission accomplished. But after. And I think that is one of my biggest accomplishments. The reality has changed forever. The reality now is that 10 years ago, most Hasidic people didn't know that trans people exist. Now, most of them do know that it exists. And sometimes I have to do radical stuff for that. Sometimes you have to be in their face. Sometimes you have to make noise, but that has changed. Hmm. And that is, I would say that was the goal. That was one of the goals that has been accomplished. And there's a lot more other goals that haven't been accomplished yet. Sure. Yeah. And before we go forward, I want to let our viewers know that we will be taking questions for Chase and Abby shortly. So please start sending them in. While we wait, um, I'm curious to know what you are both currently working on now. Chase, I saw that you're interviewing uh, Elliot Page in two weeks. Is that right? 
I am, yeah. Elliot's memoir, Page Boy, uh, yeah. is released on yeah. June 7th. He does not need this plug, but I'm going to give this plug anyway. <laughs> uh, go out and find it. And uh, we are speaking together at the Toronto International Film Festival in Toronto, and it will be live streamed to a number of cities in Canada for the Canadian launch. Very, very excited to do so. And then I am very soon to go into production on a feature film with the writer Julieta Singh, where we are attempting to tell 140 years of Canadian history through the story of a single brick and mortar structure through a single house in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Wow. That is so beautiful. Fascinating, yeah. I love architecture, so that sounds yeah. amazing. Totally. What about you, you? Uh Why am I working? Actually, if you would allow me, can I share my screen for a second? Sure. I'm just gonna, I just want to put it because it is something I wanted to share earlier, and it sure. is exactly what I'm working. One of the several things I'm working on right now. Let me just bring that up. Sorry, people, for a second are gonna see us, but I'm gonna jump away right away. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so this is just this is a website. It's called Safari. It means library in Hebrew. It's an online database of Jewish uh, texts and source sheets. Um, anyone, it's open to everyone. You don't even need an account. But if you go there, I personally have uh, somewhere around uh, 50 different source sheets of like lectures that I've given hundreds of times. Um, one thing that constantly that I that I think is part of our conversation that is part of those is, is seeing ourselves in tradition, which are different queer characters. And one of them is this one. This is a, a 13th century text, which mm -hmm. I don't have to read all of it. Just like the first line, what an awful fate for my mother that she bore a son. Hmm. Um, and then curse be the one who announced to my father it's a boy and then a bit later uh, where is it there's a line I can't find it right now obviously oh here oh but had the artisan who made me create me instead of fair woman it's just like it, it's one of many examples and I, I was saying a minute how this has to do with what I'm working on but just I wanted to bring that up in the sense of this is something it's a 13th century example, and I have on those source sheets examples going back to the, literally to the to the Bible all the way. And, and some of them are more, you know, you have to maybe not sure, but some of them are very clear, like this one. Someone in the 13th century literally say, cursed be the one who told my father it's a boy. Um, mm. And it goes on to express their feelings of wanting to be a woman. Um, so a lot, all of those lectures, so one of the, big, the biggest, I, I think what I need a lot of work from my end is um, those are being compiled into a book. So about a collection of about yeah. 100 to 150 <clears throat> lectures. Already got a publisher. It's coming out in a few months. The texts are already oh, compiled. I'm working on the commentary now. Um, so that's uh, uh, one of the projects I'm working on. Um, I that am, sounds incredible. Perhaps you can come back and discuss it when it's released. Oh, yeah, I would love to. <laughs> and then there's several other things. There is a show that is already happening, a, a, a staged uh, production of my book uh, done by amazing Tony award-winning producers and, and really cool things that is uh, just hired a director. It's it's happening and that's very exciting. Fantastic. I'm also working on some other books, but yes, that's the gist of it. Wow, <laughs> both very busy and, and quite productive. Here are some questions, they've come in. Thank you both for this important program. Can you both make a statement about the current rash of book bans impacting school and public libraries in the USA? So a library specific, uh, book specific question. I'm jumping ahead too, because I see the other questions in the chat about books that have been most meaningful to you. And I wonder if we can actually make a statement about book banning by populating this chat with a list of books that everybody should be reading. Mm -hmm. uh, right that. That's great. Um, I, I don't, yeah. Go ahead, Abby. Oh, no, like I, I agree with that. Like, you know, talk about the books. But I want to say, um, if I may paraphrase, and I'm allowed to, my entire family were literally either killed or Holocaust survivors. So I'm going to allow mm. myself to make that a, a parallel for a second but there's this i don't remember who said it like i used to remember it it just it left my mind for a second but that saying of where you um where you burn books you're going to burn people which was the case in so many places and i think in jewish history there's something that happened many times obviously the holocaust is the latest example but it goes back to like there was a big book burning of the talmud in, in paris in medieval times that led to a full expulsion and, and a total genocide of jews uh of the jews of france in medieval times, similar stories during the Crusades. And like, I can go back to so many different historical angles. So let me, if I may paraphrase that and, and give a statement, I guess it's worth looking for that. I think where you ban books, you're gonna ban people, not just mm -hmm. people with, with specific details, but you ban people altogether. Sure. And you ban people's existence. 
And that is the reality. Um, I am proud to say, I don't know if my book has been a formally banned yet, but I know there's a lot of things in there that would ban it in a lot of places. And I'm proud of that. Um, but also it's, it's mind boggling that the same people who sometimes still try to claim that they care about free speech hmm. also go ahead and ban books because they don't like it. And, and then end up banning books about the Holocaust, to talk about example, which has been banned in Florida several times, different books books about um, um, history, books about so many. So hypocritical, yeah. Just, yeah. Well, but, but that is the, that is the <clears> gist. <throat> if you ban books, you're gonna ban people's right to exist. It's no yeah. doubt. Chase? Yeah, I've been following with great attention the ongoing controversy about the book Gender Queer, which is on every banned yes. book list currently. Yeah. And I think a lot mm -hmm. about Abby's statement about by banning books, you're banning people. And I think about the access to information that so many people in my network had through books, through libraries, to trans, early trans and gender nonconforming narratives that helped us to shape the forms of our lives that we now inhabit. And so I, in keeping with my promise of, of leaving the live stream to come back, I'm going to boost C. Riley Snorton's book, Black on Both Sides, an iconic text, A Racial History of Trans Identity, and Thomas Page McBee's Amateur, a true story about what makes a man, both trans masculine writers who are continuing to shape the, the contours of my trans masculine life. And I see that there's also a note about films and want to make a throw to keeping it very trans to early cohort docs about trans life. So titles like The Aggressives, like uh, Southern Comfort, early opportunities to encounter trans people in community with each other, never letting a film pull someone away from the pack, always baking the argument and representation in and around multiples. I think that there is extraordinary political power in staying in that place. And those films and these books exist if, if you go find them. Great, thank you, Chase. And Chase, actually, for those who didn't connect it, there's a follow-up question. Can you both tell us a few of the books that have been the most meaningful to you in life? Chase shared his books and films. Abby, your turn. <laughs> um, books. Um, there's a lot, literally. I'm like addicted to books. It's not a joke. I have a problem. I buy too many books. <laughs> it's, but, it's a good um, point. <laughs> specifically trans people. Um, so I, um, when I was an undergrad at Columbia, there was a professor at Barnard, which is a part of Columbia, mm -hmm. named Jenny, Jenny Boylan, Jennifer Finney Boylan. Some of you might have heard her name. If you don't, look her up. Um, I would say relatively a pioneer trans woman um, came out in 2002 or 2003 and has written many books, but she has a book called She Is Not There, which was the first, um, I think, trans memoir that I read. Um, and just for context, I couldn't really read English until about 10 years ago. So I right. don't have, I used to read my whole life, but it was only in Yiddish and in Hebrew and there unfortunately aren't many books. Now there are a few, I think when I was growing up there, honestly, I can't think of any uh, trans stories, but She's Not There, which is a, a very powerful book. Um, there's Gender Trouble by um, uh, Judith, Judith Butler, Butler, yep. Yeah. And it's been specifically the whole concept of a gender warrior that that, that Judah talks about has been extremely powerful um, and impactful on me. Um, these are the two that come to mind. There, there's so many more. Yeah, um, Jenna, Mock, Jenna Mock's book was very interesting for me specifically. She describes a lot. I think I took a lot of inspiration for the fact that in my book, I focus a lot on childhood, like the way she describes her childhood is very powerful and the experience with that, um, we can probably go on. I would also say one other thing, if you're looking for good books to read, literally look up book ban list and the other, yep. all the books on the list are it's usually- a great books. reference. <laughs> yeah. It's a place to look for what to read. The film is Framing Agnes. It is available to watch for free through the Queens Public Library until Wednesday, June 7th. Details and the link are in the comments section. And Chase and Abby, thank you so much for this evening, for this very enlightening discussion. And thank you, everybody, for watching. And have a safe weekend. Take care, everyone. Take care. Bye.